in the 8th century Middle East, a new dynasty seized control of one of the world's greatest empires, the Islamic Caliphate. Though little remembered in the West today, the Abbasids reigned for five centuries. They oversaw an era of Islamic military dominance, city building, brilliant scholarship, and technological innovation. It has come to be remembered as Islam's golden age. This is the story of the Abbasid Caliphate. Six three two A.D. In the Arabian city of Medina, the Prophet Muhammad lies dead. His followers, professing the new religion of Islam, sweep across the Arabian Peninsula, uniting it under the rule of Abu Bakr, the first Caliph, God's deputy on earth. Then they burst upon the world stage, taking on the two superpowers of the Middle East, the Eastern Roman and Sassanid empires. Both are vulnerable after decades of war, and the Muslims wage a stunning campaign, winning victory after victory. By 651, they have overrun two-thirds of the Eastern Roman Empire, and almost all of the Sassanid Empire. But in 656, the third Caliph, Uthman, is assassinated, sparking the first Muslim civil war, or Fitna. Ali, cousin and son-in-law of the Prophet Muhammad, has the support of the people. But he's opposed by the governor of Syria, Uthman's kinsman, Muawiyah. Five years of bloodshed culminate in Ali's assassination at Kufa. Muawiyah emerges triumphant and establishes a new Umayyad caliphate. Further conquests help to forge one of the largest empires in history. But it is riven by more civil war. One challenge comes from Hussein, son of Ali, grandson of the Prophet Muhammad. He opposes the succession of Muawiyah's son, Yazid. But in 680, he and his followers are defeated and killed at the Battle of Karbala. Supporters of Ali and his descendants will later become the Shiites. They still commemorate Hussein's death each year, on the day of Ashura. The vast Umayyad Caliphate continues to expand, but it contains serious internal divisions. Much of what we know about the Umayyad Caliphate comes from later sources, often hostile. But it seems clear that the small Arab Muslim elite that dominated this great empire was increasingly unpopular with many of its subjects, including some of those later termed Dhimmi. These were non-Muslims, including Christians, Jews and Zoroastrians, who were treated as an underclass and made to pay extra tax. Even those who did convert to Islam, known as Mawali, were often treated as second-class subjects. Decades of discontent were about to boil over. The symbol of Umayyad authority was their white banner. But in 747, a new symbol rises to challenge their rule. The black banners of the Abbasids. The Abbasids are an Arab family, descended from the Prophet Muhammad's uncle Al-Abbas, from whom they take their name. They and their supporters believe this blood tie to the Prophet gives them legitimate claim to the title of Caliph. Far more so than the Umayyads, whom the Abbasids later portray as decadent and despised. The Abbasids promise a return to true Islam, 
to correct teachings and moral leadership, and sent missionaries and agents out across the Caliphate to spread their message. In 747, with the Caliphate once more racked by revolt and civil war, the Abbasids will seize their chance. In eastern Khurasan, a general named Abu Muslim, probably a Persian convert, launches a revolt and takes the black banner of the Hashemites as his symbol. The Hashemites, descendants of Hashim, are the extended family of the Prophet, with the Abbasids prominent amongst them. This frontier region, today comprising northeastern Iran and parts of Turkmenistan and Afghanistan, is particularly ripe for rebellion. Here, Arabs and non-Arab converts live side by side. They intermarry and fight alongside each other to defend the frontier. For many, the Umayyads are distant and unpopular overlords. What's more, opposition has been stoked for decades by Hashemite agents and missionaries who seek to topple the Umayyads and replace them with one of their own. They have sowed the seeds of revolution. So when Abu Muslim begins his revolt, he quickly attracts followers, Arabs, Persians and Central Asians, many of whom are experienced warriors. And he proves a brilliant commander, winning a series of victories over Umayyad forces and occupying Kufa, capital of Iraq, in 749. The Abbasids now assume leadership of this revolution. And the following year, their forces meet the army of the Umayyad Caliph, Marwan II, at the Zab River. Most of what we know about the battle that follows comes from Abbasid sources. Caliph Marwan appears to have been a brave but reckless commander, launching a head-on cavalry charge against the Abbasid line. Abbasid historians tell how their own troops, inspired by recent victories, stand fast. Their spear walls repel the cavalry. The attack ends in disaster. Umayyad morale is broken. Their army routed. Marwan himself flees the battle, but is pursued and killed in Egypt. Other Umayyads are likewise hunted down and exterminated. Even graves are desecrated. One surviving member of the dynasty, Abd al-Rahman, flees to Spain. Just a few years later, he establishes the Emirate of Cordoba, a second Umayyad dynasty that would flourish in Iberia for centuries. Meanwhile, Abu Abbas al-Safar becomes the first Abbasid Caliph, though it will take the Abbasids more than a decade to consolidate their hold on power. Al-Safar moves the Caliph's residence from Haran to Kufa, closer to the Abbasid power base in Persia. In 751, he sends an army to curb the westward expansion of the Chinese Tang dynasty. The campaign culminates in a bloody victory at the Battle of Talas, but also marks the limit of the Caliphate's eastward expansion. Many who'd helped overthrow the Umayyads had sought the end of hereditary rule and a return to Caliphs elected from within an elite group. They are to be disappointed. In 754, Al-Safar is succeeded by his brother, Al-Mansur. The Abbasids will be the new ruling dynasty, and Al-Mansur will prove one of its greatest caliphs. But his reign begins inauspiciously, with the execution of the brilliant and popular general Abu Muslim, now regarded as a potentially dangerous rival. Al-Mansur faces rebellion by the Alids, a powerful clan descended from the Prophet's son-in-law, Ali. They resent the growing dynastic power of the Abbasids 
and press their own claim to rule. Al-Mansur crushes the last major Alid revolt in 762, ushering in an era of stability, prosperity and peace. That year he orders the construction of a new capital on the banks of the Tigris River. Officially, it is to be known as Madinat as Salam, the city of peace. It will prove his greatest legacy, a city that will become one of the glories of the medieval world. Baghdad. In the reign of Al-Mansur's grandson, Harun al-Rashid, the Caliphate flourishes as never before, with Baghdad at its heart. There are many legends told about Caliph Harun al-Rashid, the rightly guided. He is, after all, a central figure in 1001 Nights, the masterpiece of Arabic literature. The image of al-Rashid that reaches us from such sources is of a devout, wise and beneficent ruler who prayed a hundred times a day and each morning gave a thousand dirhams to good causes. In legend, al-Rashid wandered the streets of Baghdad disguised as a beggar to see how his subjects lived. He was a brilliant horseman and patron of the arts and a keen chess player. His court was a place where religion and philosophy could be argued and debated openly, even, on occasion, by a woman. In the Caliphate, as in the rest of the medieval world, few women held high status in their own right. But as mothers, wives and concubines, they could exert huge influence. al Khazuran, once a Yemeni slave girl, rose from concubine to caliph's wife, and wielded significant power during the reign of her husband, Caliph al-Mahdi, and son, Caliph al-Rashid. Famed for her intelligence and learning, she held discussions on policy and military strategy, received foreign ambassadors, and intervened on questions of justice. Much of her own enormous wealth she spent on public works and charity, Many likened her to a co-ruler, or even the real caliph. The success of al-Rashid's reign was underpinned by efficient government and administration. Much of it was modelled on that of their predecessors, the Sassanids, and they made extensive use of Persian and Central Asian bureaucrats. Of particular note was the Barmakid family. The Barmakids were descended from high priests of the Buddhist temple of Nobahar, near Balkh, in modern Afghanistan. As early Abbasid allies, they played an important role in government, helping to foster an age of Islamic statecraft, imbued with elements of Sasanian Persian culture. They served the Abbasids well for three generations, but the power games of court could be dangerous and unpredictable. In 803, al-Rashid decided the Barmakids had got a little too big for their boots. The family experienced a sudden and dramatic fall from favour, with many of its members imprisoned or executed. Their demise ended Barmakid control of the post of Vizier, a position that had recently emerged at court as the Caliph's senior advisor and chief minister. It was a role of enormous significance. Some viziers would later wield so much power, they overshadowed the Caliph himself. The fame of al-Rashid's court spread far and wide. Charlemagne, King of the Franks, Holy Roman Emperor and the most powerful ruler in Europe, sent several embassies to Baghdad. 
In return, Al Rashid sent him dazzling gifts, including perfume, ivory chessboards, a marvellous water clock, and even an elephant named Abu Abbas, which lived for several years at Charlemagne's court in Aachen. Cultural life in the Caliphate, and Baghdad in particular, was remarkably cosmopolitan. The Abbasid court even celebrated Persian holidays, such as Noruz, Persian New Year. Such open-mindedness helped the Caliphate to flourish as a centre of culture, science, arts and medicine. The centre of learning was the city's famous library, Beit al-Hikmah, the House of Wisdom, though little of its function is known today. Here and across the Caliphate, scholars translated classical works from Greek, Middle Persian and Sanskrit into Arabic. Their efforts ensured the survival of countless works that would otherwise have been lost, including those by great figures such as Aristotle and Galen. They also made many of their own original discoveries, knowledge that would come to be much sought after by the medieval West. Baghdad's scholars led the world in many fields. Al-Kindi, known as the philosopher of the Arabs, was a famed polymath who wrote on logic, psychology, astronomy, astrology and many other topics. Al-Khwarezmi's contribution to mathematics led to him being dubbed the father of algebra. The Latinized version of his name, Algorismus, is the origin of our word algorithm. The Christian scholar Hunayn ibn Ishaq was nicknamed the Sheikh of Translators for his role translating ancient texts into Arabic. Material culture also flourished under the Abbasids with the introduction of glazed pottery in the 9th century, allowing new artistic possibilities. Many colourful pieces, decorated with animals and Kufic lettering, have been discovered across the former Caliphate from this period. The Abbasid Caliphate also benefited from its position astride the Silk Roads, the name for the ancient network of trade routes linking Europe and Asia. Valuable imports travelled along this route, such as silk, spices, ivory, gemstones, and even thoroughbred horses. To encourage this trade, the Abbasids built new roads, as well as inns, hospices and wells for the comfort of travellers. New ideas and technology also flowed along the Silk Roads. Chinese papermaking techniques first reached the Muslim world under the Umayyads. But it was under the Abbasids that paper production really took off. Much cheaper than parchment or papyri, abundant supplies of paper transformed the practice of administration and bookmaking, and helped medieval Islam to become one of the most bookish cultures in world history. In the 7th century, the first Arab conquests had pushed the frontier of the Eastern Roman Empire back to the Taurus Mountains. Since then, the Caliphate and Empire had been in a state of almost perpetual war, with frequent raids by both sides across the Syrian frontier. Twice the Arabs had even besieged Constantinople itself, but failed to take the great city. In 782, al-Rashid himself had led an Abbasid force as far as the shores of the Bosphorus. By 804, the Eastern Roman Empire was paying annual tribute to the Caliphate. When Emperor Nikephoros stopped the payments, an Abbasid army crossed the Taurus Mountains and took his army by surprise at Krasos. The Romans suffered a heavy defeat. The Emperor himself was lucky to escape with his life. 
The cycle of raid and counter-raid continued for years, with al-Rashid even moving the Abbasid capital to Raqqa, to be closer to the frontier. But this fixation on his rival to the west may have blinded the Caliph to trouble in the east. In 809, news arrived of revolt in Khorasan. It was while travelling east to face down this rebellion that Caliph Harun al-Rashid became sick and died. His 22-year reign would come to be seen as a golden age for the Abbasid Caliphate, a time of prosperity, stability, intellectual and cultural achievement. But al-Rashid's own efforts to ensure a peaceful succession were about to backfire disastrously and plunge the Caliphate back into civil war. In the second and final part of Islam's Golden Age, we chart the catastrophe of renewed civil war, the rise of a new caste of slave soldiers, and the devastating onslaught of the Mongols. Big thanks to our series historical advisor, Professor Antoine Borut of the University of Maryland. You can find out more about Antoine's projects and publications via his university webpage, using the link in the video description. Thanks also to the YouTube channel Al Mukadima for additional help with research. You can watch many great videos about Islamic history on their channel via the link below. Thanks most of all to the Epic History TV Patreon supporters who make this channel possible. Visit our Patreon page to find out how you can support our work, help choose future topics, and get ad-free early access to new videos.